Welcome back to the Attract Online conference. Uh, we hope that you had the chance to chat already with the other participants. That it is a possibility that we have from the conference website. And that also that you have taken the possibility to schedule one-to-one -one meet, virtual meeting with them starting today at four until tomorrow at six. So we have special slots. And for this, you need to be registered and reach to the other participant to schedule a common slot together. So really take the chance of this because this is the networking opportunity that will only last until tomorrow at six. And we have a lot of interesting profiles gathered on the platform, close to 1,000. So I'm sure you're going to find people with whom to interact and look for opportunities for the future, especially regarding igniting the deep tech, deep tech sorry, revolution. So it's time now to invite you to our last panel of the day. So the panel will look into the funding opportunities uh, regarding disruptive innovation, as well as the role of research infrastructures in this context. So it, has, uh, uh, it will be moderated by Mark Ferguson, who is the Director General of Science Foundation Ireland, and also the Chair of the EIC Pilot Advisory Board. And so I'll let you now uh, with Mark and his panelists for a very lively discussion. On this panel, we're going to discuss about innovation and how we can support innovation in Europe. So I've got a very distinguished uh, uh, group of panelists. I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and say in about a couple of minutes uh, what it is that they contribute to the uh, innovation ecosystem in Europe. Marie, can I start with you first, please? So thank you, Mark, for the introduction and thanks, guys, for having me here. Uh, my name is Marie. I work for Hightech Gründerfonds. This is a German early stage fund and we do early stage investment in um, startups that are in high tech. So across different sectors from industrial tech to life science, chemistry, material science, all the way to digital. Uh, we are partially German state funded and partially from 33 LPs uh, have come from the corporate world. Uh, my background is in chemistry, so I have a PhD in nanochemistry, did an MBA, and then went into venture capital. Um, I specialize in the specific area of chemistry due to my background, and um, I'm very pleased to be here today. Great, thank you. We'll come back to that in a moment with very interesting uh, funds. Leopold, could you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you do? Sure, Mark. So I'm Leopold de Midelaire. I'm here on behalf of ERMA, the European Industrial Research Management Association, uh, which clusters uh, cross-industrial uh, cross interest in R&D and applied R&D. I'm honorary president of this association and I spent all my career in industry, especially with the Solvay, where I ended up in uh, managing the long-term research and corporate venturing, which is obviously a link to this ATTRACT program, as you can, uh, as you can imagine. I'm a member of the pro project advisory committee of the ATTRACT program, so I will be the voice to a certain extent of industry here. Great, thank you very much. Fabian, tell us all about yourself and the European Innovation Council, which I know a little bit about, so over to you, Fabian. Thank you, Marc, and uh, thanks also for having me here today. I'm Fabienne Gauthier, and I work at the European Commission, and I'm um, working in DG Research and uh, Innovation, which is uh, supporting uh, research and innovation all over Europe, uh, with its uh, framework program uh, Horizon 2020, and also in the future, very soon, Horizon Europe. I'm uh, working in the task force in charge of uh, setting up uh, the European Innovation uh, Council for the future. Um, this uh, European Innovation Council uh, will support breakthrough innovation and I'm uh, working in the unit uh, in charge of uh, European Innovation Ecosystems, which is the policy support uh, part of the Euro future European Innovation Council, which aims basically at uh, bringing together the various actors of uh, innovation ecosystems in Europe. So uh, I'll tell you more about EIC in a moment, um, and I'm very happy to be here today. Many thanks. Thank you very much. And Giorgio, Say a few words about yourself and, and your background and how it's of relevance for innovation. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Giorgio Rossi. I'm an experimental physicist and university professor of physics in Milano. And I've been involved with uh, 
uh, research infrastructures for a large part of my uh, career, uh, managing infrastructures, operating, but also serving as chair of ESFRI, as well as of chair of a, a high-level expert group that more recently has addressed the best um, possible configuration for of infrastructures for long-term sustainability and for optimized funding. So in uh, all of these, uh, of course, the uh, interface between fundamental research and innovation has been uh, discussed and addressed and uh, uh, some ideas came up that turned out to be innovation in the service of the infrastructures, but also uh, services from infrastructure to help innovation motivated, of course, by the society and the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Mark Ferguson. I'm the Director General of Science Foundation Ireland. I'm the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Government of Ireland. And I'm also the Chair of the Advisory Board of the European Innovation Council. So what we'll do is we'll kick off uh, with a few comments. Touched on here was the importance, and certainly initially, of public funding to support innovation. Uh, Marie, I know the Grunde funds uh, started with initially public funding and then brought in private funding. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please? Sure, of course. So, um, as the name says, well, high tech Gründer von Gründer actually means foundation or incorporation fund uh, in German. So, we were uh, founded in 2005 um, as a public fund that specialized in early stage investments. Um, now we're in our third fund. So, we have about 900 million euros under management across these three funds. And our third fund has um, right around 60 percent funding from the german ministry of economics and finance and um, german state-owned developmental bank so 60 percent private uh, public and 40 percent private from 35 corporate um, corporate lps like bosch Bayer, sap bsf evonik and the dax list plus a couple of um, mid-sized companies so um, when we were founded, our goal is, was and still is to support innovation in Germany. But of course, since we're also private now, we have this sort of private um, point of view that we also want to make sustainable investments. So first, innovation in Germany. So really going to research institutions, bringing good quality German research out of universities and beyond, but also with this other um, business sort of aspect. And um, like I said, we're pretty successful. So we've been on the market for 15 years. We've just celebrated our 15th uh, anniversary and um, some of our points for best practice, I guess, uh, why that we're so successful. I mean, this is obviously an ongoing analysis from our side is um, I think we're quite unique in um, how decisions are made in our board. So although we're public private with public uh, being these, um, you know, the, this money from the German state, obviously on our decision making boards, um, we don't have politicians and bureaucrats, God forbid, sitting uh, on these boards, not that I have anything against uh, politicians and bureaucrats, but really the German state sort of sends three people who vote on behalf of them. And that would be one person who is the director of Max Planck Institute, another so research institute, a serial entrepreneur in CLVC, plus voting from the from the corporate side. So this sort of networking effect with industry, as well as a decision making body that's not all too public. Very good. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. And I guess these public private uh, uh, conglomerates and, and co investment really important for early stage high tech and for crowding in uh, further private investment. I mean, that's part of the thinking behind the European Innovation Council. Fabian, you want to tell us a little bit about that and, and how uh, it's hoped that the European Commission can use its funding to crowd in uh, private funding and also to support high tech early stage uh, um, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, indeed, uh, public funding is key, I believe, in uh, supporting uh, innovation and um, throughout the whole uh, innovation chain. Um, and as you mentioned, just it's um, we need investment and there is in Europe uh, a funding gap uh, on uh, innovation and also a gap in uh, bridging uh, public funding and also private investment. And I believe that here uh, public funding can play a role um, because um, 
usually innovation are high risky project deep tech uh, um, um, deep tech projects it's high risky and uh, of, very often the innovate the in investors are reluctant uh, to support young companies to support high risky projects and i believe that here uh, public institutions uh, and also the european commission can play a role because we can push the process in uh, supporting uh, innovation in providing funding to it also in uh, attracting investors in a way that uh, through the fact that we uh, support uh, these uh, high risky projects and innovators, uh, we de-risk these projects. And that is precisely what uh, the EIC uh, is doing. Uh, the objective is uh, with the EIC to support this breakthrough innovation, to support deep tech projects and to become for the future in attracting investors to become what we call uh, our EU unicorn factory. So the uh, European Innovation uh, uh, Council uh, has been uh, set up for this purpose. Uh, we have a pilot running under Horizon 2020 and we will have a fully fledged uh, European Innovation Council under Horizon Europe. So how is it working? Basically through the European Innovation Council we uh, support uh, innovation from early stage research up to the moment where this uh, research and the innovation reaches the market and we support this project financially. So here we will provide through the European Innovation Council a mixture of funding where we will provide grants to these early stage projects and the more they get uh, to the closer to the market we will be able through the European Innovation Council to provide also another type of funding which is quite new under the um, framework programs of research that we are uh, implementing for years, uh, we will provide the possibility to have uh, equity finance to these projects. And this will uh, attract uh, other investors because we will be those which will step in first uh, in those uh, companies, in those uh, promising companies. And uh, we will uh, also expect, we, will, we expect attracting other investors. We have launched uh, a pilot for the EIC under Horizon 2020 with a budget of uh, 3 billion from, uh, for 2018 uh, to 2020. And um, it has been very successful. If we look at the figures from the first calls, which have been, um, which have been uh, launched since 2018, we have attracted uh, more than 10,000 applications from startups and SMEs uh, for the EIC accelerator. And we have, uh, through uh, this application, a cumulative budget of, uh, of um, a request for budget of uh, around 26 billion euros. So you can see here how much money funding is needed in order to support these companies. And uh, it also has uh, attracted this pilot uh, private investment, uh, also at the level of 2.5 billion uh, euros. So it is, these are quite huge amounts which are there and which support those companies from the early stage phase until the moment where they will reach the, the, the market and through the European innovation ecosystems that's what we intend to support now through this pilot and also for the future um, um, via what we call the uh, pathfinder where we support these uh, projects via grants and this early stage research which is getting close to the market and then via the accelerator where we have those projects which are major to attract investment and to attract also private investment. So this is in a nutshell how the uh, European Innovation Council uh, is uh, working and what we intend to do with the funding uh, under Horizon, 20, Horizon Europe, the future from a program for research, which is uh, in the proposal for the Commission at an amount of 10 billion euros. So this is uh, uh, the uh, overall uh, um, um, framework in which we will be supporting uh, breakthrough innovation in the future. Thank you. That's very interesting and I mean obviously shows a great demand which is uh, uh, very good. Uh, obviously we need to try and uh, fill that with the appropriate finance. Now companies are really important uh, for taking innovation uh, through to the market. I mean they have huge reach in terms of sale, they have a lot of skills and so on. Leopold, do you want to say something about the kind of corporate environment and how that can help innovators, particularly in Europe? So yes, Mark, uh, definitely. It's all about breaking, breaking walls, you know, and, and these walls are becoming thicker and thicker when you go down the road to applications indeed. And the reason for that is that the financial risk you take in industry is increasing considerably. And so 
trying to find the right people in industry to talk to and to build something relevant around the whole chain from the ideas, individual and team ideas, to a global market application, <laughs> because it's all about that for us. It's something that is really difficult with industry, but there are ways to do it. I will tell you that maybe later, but it's, it's difficult because the time frame is completely different. At one point you can publish or convince people over a click and a campaign, uh, a campaign for promoting a product or, uh, or, or a new technology is something very, very, very long to do. So I feel that the first output of all these deep tech programs is to prepare and to provide new people, uh, new engineers, new scientists that, that are coming on stream and are looking at very old problems in a completely different way, you know? Imagery for them is not the imagery of myself. I was trained in, in, in NMR imagery. It's no more, no way to look at it the way I did in the past. So it's the same. So you prepare these new people that will break these walls, you know? And usually the hierarchy has no clue how to do it because it's long-term thing. It's a long-term thing. So you are talking about the education time frame, which takes for a human being 20 years at the end. But so that's the, the, first, the first output, I would say. So I'm really happy to see that all this the financing of the first steps is done by definition by public money. Education is made by public money in our regions itself. And so I'm very happy to see that, and industry is very happy to see that. Problem is that to make this, this connection without interrupting the chain. And so I would say that talking to the networks of industrials called the corporate venturing networks are very important. The people that are allowed to think out of the box and risk a piece of money with public partners, whatever, to check if uh, the, the, the new deep technologies and the new people arising are relevant for their goals, for the long-term, go mid-term mid and long-term goals. That's my first quote for that. If I may add a point, um, Mark, if I'm allowed to sort of sure. jump into discussion, I think uh, we cannot undervaluate the importance of the private sector and industry. So just as you said, Leopold, like for our fund, I think one of its inherent properties, what's so the value we bring to the startups is indeed that in our board, our LPs, the corporates, the industry is sitting. And obviously it's not just a yay or nay, but there, there's an ongoing circular discussion. I mean, we bind or we ask our LPs, we ask our corporate indus industrial investors to sort of also participate in the reference calls and the whole due diligence process. So no matter how good a scientific innovation is, if there is no market relevance, it's not going to happen. And the earlier this sort of feedback loop happens and the earlier the founders can get qualified feedback, this, this obviously helps the process much further. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to jump in on what uh, Marie said and also Leopold, because they mentioned the different actors uh, that play a role in, in innovation. And I believe that um, this is key, making these uh, different connections. And while we are talking a lot about funding through our programs, uh, through our strategies, there is also another element which is important besides funding. Funding is not, is not the only solution. Uh, to, to, to tackle the challenges that we have nowadays. Um, there are also other means which are important uh, in order to build, uh, uh, to build the connection within the different players in, in, in the innovation ecosystem. And that's precisely also what we will do uh, in the future, uh, dedicating specific policy support to bring together the, the various actors, the universities together with, um, with the startups, uh, with the investors, um, with uh, public authorities, with regional, local actors and so on. And here there is also a role to play in building an ecosystem that supports also the innovators, not only through funding, but also through the, the different connections and through the means that they put at their disposal, for instance, to get the appropriate competences in their companies and so on. So I believe that this aspect, which is policy and supporting innovators and supporting the ecosystem is also a key element uh, to bring uh, innovation forward. 
Absolutely. It's all part of the system. Leopold, I'm going to bring you in and then Giorgio, I'm going to get you to talk about infrastructure and the importance of infrastructure for innovation and access to big kit for some companies. But Leopold, you wanted to react first. Yes, I just jumped in there because I think that the public involvement brings more than money indeed. It brings relevance and it brings social relevance because by definition in industry we sometimes are we have to confess it, blinded by money, you know? And then you, you, bring, you bring something something more. I often see that in boards for small startups, you, you bring social relevance. You, these big challenges are coming in. Jobs are very important. And all of all the dimensions without, without this dimension, by the way, the project will not evolve in time. It's more than, than money. I completely agree about that. And even in industry, we think like that. It's absolutely more than money, and I was on an interesting uh, uh, call uh, last week with, uh, with Eric Schmidt, and he, he gave a quotation. He said, you know, your happiness is proportional to the quality of your thoughts. So, so if you have great thoughts as an innovator, you can solve social problems and you can make money, but you can also be happy, uh, which is wonderful. Giorgio, you want to talk a little bit about infrastructure and uh, you know, how uh, innovators can access that infrastructure, whether it's big kit or maybe a lab uh, space that they need? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, research infrastructures have been uh, built all over the world and with particular attention in Europe to support excellent science. So the so-called curiosity-driven science. So to give to, to European scientists the best possible tools uh, to uh, perform uh, uh, observations, uh, uh, experiments, uh, uh, analysis. And uh, this is the core business. But as the whole ensemble of the research infrastructure grew, it became uh, uh, very uh, clear that they can provide new kind of services uh, by addressing uh, aspects that of complex problems that come from society or that come from economy uh, and that are not of a curiosity driven uh, nature but are part of uh, uh, issues that the society wants to address. But uh, let me say that, and this is being done by interconnecting re research infrastructures by the effort of making uh, all the data of science uh, available uh, through the European Open Science Cloud and uh, um, this kind of uh, uh, approach. But let me say something about innovation. Innovation is about making, uh, products or making uh, methods based on existing knowledge. I remember in the very early 80s, when I moved back uh, from the US to France, uh, in the control room of the linear accelerator where I was working, there were touch screens uh, in the control room to open valves to set uh, values of uh, fields and so on. And then it took over 30 years before the touch screen has become a uh, daily uh, tool uh, on telephones or on computers, on the car displays and so on. So uh, the uh, knowledge that was developed for a need at a research infrastructure has been there uh, for a long time and maybe too long maybe it would have been uh, uh, good if there were activities favoring the uh, idea that this technology could be captured for other uses that were not only you know synchronizing in the best way and simplifying the work of operators of complex uh, uh, physics uh, um, instruments and if i am allowed just to make one uh, example of something that is happening nowadays that happened uh, last year uh, in the construction of research infrastructure in Brazil, the National Synchrotron, Sirio, they uh, needed to do everything at home because of uh, political and uh, economic reasons. And as they are ambitious and they have built a top 
world top uh, level facility ranging uh, in the same class as the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility, uh, they needed to uh, train industry, local industry. The Sao Paulo state is very strong in engineering, but still they did not have the competence to build such a sophisticated uh, accelerator system. And so they trained 20 to 25, I forget the exact number, companies to produce and then what they needed. And then they put them in competition and two or three of these companies got the market and uh, got the knowledge, got the uh, instruction and uh, they produced, several of them produced a bid. And so they were uh, well equipped to be uh, high tech uh, companies for other applications. So this is the infrastructure that creates innovation. So the demand of the infrastructure creates innovation also for the industry. Now the reverse pro problem is a little more tricky. So how well a, a company that has a clear uh, ideas of what is its innovation needs can use the infrastructures and there is a debate on that of course thank you thank you very much that's very interesting i mean the idea of having to do things uh, remotely i guess has really come to the fore with the covid pandemic which if anything has accelerated uh, the public perception of science and innovation and the importance of it so I guess coming out of COVID, um, I'm going to ask uh, ask any of you or, or each of you, you know, what do you think are going to be the really interesting innovations? Do you think we're going to see an acceleration of digitalization, AI? Do you think people are going to really look at the climate agenda to, with with an innovative approach to try and make money and do good for the planet at the same time? So, so do you think there are huge opportunities coming out of COVID, and what could we in Europe do to get more innovators into that space? Anyone want to take that first? Or I'm going to pick on someone. Fabian, I'm going to pick on you. Uh, and then I'm going to pick on you, Marie. <laughs> so over to you first, Fabian. Thank you, Mark. Um, yes, through the COVID crisis, we, 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 we can see that there are uh, huge uh, challenges that we have to face. And uh, we need a response uh, to these challenges. Um, the, the, the crisis that we face has uh, changed dramatically, has changed drast drastically the way we were working. It happened uh, from, uh, from from uh, it happened almost overnight, where we had uh, where we had the, 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 the where, where we had the whole uh, economies and uh, and societies to stop to uh, kept uh, lo lockdown to find other ways uh, to work to also uh, uh, fight to. Uh, to support also research and innovation to find a to, to find a vaccine and so on, so we can see that how rapidly changes are coming and that we can also face huge challenges uh, which are not only uh, um, national or local or at European level. These challenges are global. Other challenges which are which are uh, essential and which are also linked uh, to the uh, current crisis that we face nowadays, which are of course uh, the climate change, and this is also what we need, need to tackle the economic and the social situation that will arise from the current pandemic and also from uh, the. these are typically challenges that we need to face that we cannot solve alone but where we need to act globally and where we need to uh, tackle them all together at european and also at, nat at, at national level and in cooperation also uh, globally so these uh, priorities are clearly priorities of the european commission commission climate uh, the current pa pandemic we responded at the level level of the commission very quickly uh, to this uh, pandemic providing funding uh, to this pandemic participating leading uh, to the global pledge where we uh, gathered uh, around 16 billion uh, euro to uh, to find uh, uh, access to test treatments and the uh, vaccines uh, for, for the pandemic. So here, this kind of priorities which emerge or which are uh, in front of us, uh, we have to tackle them. And there is also another key priority that we have uh, in the Commission, which is, of course, the digitization of the society. And again, the current situation 
uh, clearly uh, an example how um, quickly also, because this is also uh, to be seen, we, we have uh, seen how fast also the societies and the economy, economies can adapt and can uh, adapt to change, to, uh, can adapt to situations that were unforeseen uh, a few uh, weeks or months before. And here the digitization also of our economies and of our, our societies will be key. And artificial intelligence is also linked to this. So there is a number of key priorities that we are, of course, uh, tackling at the level of the European Commission and on which we provide policy measures and funding, like, for instance, uh, the example of uh, funding to support, uh, uh, to support research and innovation linked to the current pandemic, where we uh, reacted quite quickly and also via the European Innovation Council, where we were also able to uh, quickly put uh, some funding at the disposal of uh, the EIC in order to uh, search for uh, remedies to the current crisis. So yes, key priorities that we need to tackle all together at European and national level and globally. Thank you. I think it's uh, really interesting. You know, it's often said COVID accelerated the trends yeah. we knew about before COVID. It's accelerated digitalization, it's accelerated virtual learning, artificial intelligence, robotics, automation. I used to tell people that, um, you know, there would be robots, talking robots looking after old people. And before COVID, people used to think I was nuts when I said that. And <laughs> now it's actually a real commercial possibility. In fact, a very good uh, possibility. So, so really interesting how uh, these uh, pandemics produce challenges on one hand, but huge opportunities on the other. Marie, have you seen some of that in your investment? Yeah, so definitely, I agree that um, even on a company level, right, COVID has been sort of a forceful digital. I mean, we never used to have meetings on Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Well, some rarely, but this has sort of become the norm. And what we sort of see in the investment space is also that huge amount of public funding um, for sectors that were I wouldn't say largely overlooked, but less sexy in terms of investment. I mean, example is antivirals, antimicrobials. In terms of investments, they were rather unsexy, but we see this huge amount of public funding that goes into these fields because I think for people, it's been it's been a huge wake up call. And topics also like sustainability, which you mentioned, I think it, it really does take a pandemic for people to realize, oh, so what I take for granted like the fact that when I'm in the hospital, I take antibiotics and I don't die from a very simple infection, like the fact that I go to the supermarket and my supply chains are working, like the fact that I have things to eat, I have water in terms of sustainability, all these things that you take for granted on a day to day basis actually hangs by a thread and that we as society actually have to do sustainable investments, that more money has to go in these fields that have not typically been the fields that have brought the, 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 the most return. Um, nevertheless, I think that although the, this huge wave of public perception and the funding that comes with this is very positive, Obviously, you also have to look at uh, issues like IP transfer from research institutions into startups. So you are putting a lot of money into research that is going to incentivize people to spin out. However, there are certain steps in between that and something becoming a sustainable startup that is going to make a part market impact. And for me, that's really the topic of, well, first of all, the founders being able to structure a business plan the founders getting out of there, but also the universities and the founders coming to a good consensus what it takes for the IP to spin out of research institutions, because obviously the IP has been made within the research institutions and the conditions thereof for it to go into the market also has to be profitable and favorable for the founders, for the research institutions, obviously, but also investors that come in and invest in that kind of company. Very good, thank you. I, I agree. I mean, it's interesting, during the, the Corona crisis the, in Science Foundation Ireland in uh, February, we did, I think, on average, four uh, video conferences, Zoom calls per month. In April, we did 4,000. In July, we did 8,000. So the scale of the, of the change is, you know, four to 4,000 to 8,000. I guess what you want, Marie, is the same scale of change and the transfer of IP from universities into companies. If we could accelerate how we uh, get some of that done, it would be a really interesting uh, perspective. Leopold, do you have anything from either the COVID or the IP uh, environment uh, from companies? Because clearly you want to spin businesses out of companies as well as out of universities. 
Sure, 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 Mike. I, so I learned the Ferguson law now. You double the, the number of, uh, of, Zoom, <laughs> of Zoom meetings every month. That's interesting. So uh, now, first of all, it's a bit scary for industry what happens. Everything is, uh, is moving so fast. And at the end, industry to a certain extent is anchored by its hard assets. You, you have to depreciate your assets and you can be bound by a production of an outdated chip uh, uh, factory, for instance. But by the way, you don't just close it down and restart something else. So there is a, 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 time, a timing issue there that makes industry to a certain extent very scary. And second thing that makes it scary is this necessity now to work cross boundary in industry. Look at medtech, it's absolutely uh, obvious. If you don't link, uh, link physics to me medical uh, applications, to uh, instrumentation, to mathematics and smart, smart uh, statistics and all these things, you just end in nothing. So it's a really, really difficult time for industry to, to face this digital age, by the way. On top of that, the people are also aging and the people that, that you recruit, you have to train them because they were not trained uh, to, to face these kinds of tools. It's not easy. It's not an easy turn, by the way. Concerning IP, it's also something that is very strange. I hear sometimes people saying, what's the interest still to make IP? Because the, the, the faster we go, the, be the best it gets. So why to be, to be stuck for 20 years with an outdated patent at the end? Uh, and the, the whole thing, the whole, the whole thing is, is really uh, stuck in, in what happened in the past. IP, I own something, and nowadays owning something doesn't mean anything, you know? And that's really a, a really uh, paradigm change. I think the IP question is interesting. I mean, clearly, it's different in different sectors. If you're making pharmaceutical drugs or biotech, you know, it's a very, very significant investment over a long period of time. And, and I guess their IP is central. But, but in ICT and, and AI, where things move so quickly, perhaps less so. And I think what's really interesting also is in those uh, sectors where the open uh, source, uh, not just open publishing, but open source has really given rise to new business models, which are essentially service models. So the code and, and the, and the uh, uh, knowledge is open, but the way in which you service the client is actually what you make your business on. And, and that's actually been very interesting. I mean, we saw that with COVID tracker apps, for example, where the code was completely public for uh, privacy, uh, but the company still made money because they were able to service the app and, and process the data and so on. So I think it's a very interesting uh, question, you know, the, the, the concept between what you need to protect on the one hand and sometimes how you can make a business even in an open environment. Giorgio, you have anything on uh, these aspects? Yes, I think uh, COVID uh, uh, has uh, uh, changed a number of things, as we already said, but has shown also um, an important issue uh, that has to do with, uh, with the science, uh, with the progress, with the innovation, and I also add uh, with democracy, and that is availability of data. Uh, in all these uh, period, we, the citizens have been faced with very partial uh, information and uh, very inconsistent uh, uh, data still in the news you know the number of every day's um, uh, infected new infected people and then the comment yes but we did more checks or yes but we did less so that's not information information will be how many of the checked people showed the uh, infection is it increasing or is stable or is decreasing so we have uh, addressed this in the domain of uh, the action of the european open science cloud the commission has supported and this is interesting uh, a um, COVID-19 data portal. Now, the COVID-19 data portal has uh, uh, created an easy interface to address 
all the scientific data relevant to COVID, and these are, you know, the uh, virus genoma, the human genoma, uh, and all of these, in fact, was already very well linked because this is the science, the hard science part in biology, which is well connected. It's good to make it easier for the people. But what is missing is the clinical data, the phenotype data, those data that are absolutely necessary in order to make a model that will connect the hard science to the, what is happening to the real population and perhaps develop models of the development. These has uh, the development of the infection. Uh, this has been missed up to now and still now, and I think it is a major problem. So uh, some practices that are already well uh, eradicated and well present in the scientific community need to cross over to society uh, an intelligent interpretation of the GDPR data privacy protection must be applied, which is compatible with the rules, to apply them intelligently and not use them as a fence to say we do nothing because we don't want to risk any, any uh, problem uh, on that ground. And making uh, a real um, open access to all the relevant data for the pandemics or in the future for a climate uh, emer urgency or from anything like that is the basis for science. We have heard many scientists fighting with each other on TV, but because they were based, they, they were arguing opinions, not based on data and data analysis. And Very good. it has been a big problem and I hope a lesson that we are learning for. Uh, Absolutely, and open data is really good for innovators because you can uh, explore the data to try and uh, come up with uh, new products or, or, or so on. So we're coming near the end of the session. I'm gonna go around quickly and ask everyone, you know, what do you think additionally needs to be done? Clearly there's a lot happening. Uh, the European Innovation Council, the Grunde Funds, uh, initiatives out of universities, initiatives out of companies and so on. But what do you think needs to be done to uh, accelerate uh, the uh, deep tech uh, innovation in Europe, to accelerate the scale up of those companies to be really important uh, companies? So everything from finding uh, through to scale up, whether it's linking national initiatives with European initiatives or just stuff that we're not doing or stuff we need to do more of. So what do you think we could do to do more with innovation? Murray, over to you first. I think that's a very multifaceted question slash problem. So first of all, I think the buildup of a intertwined ecosystem is first of all necessary. So I think the problem right now is that, well, it also has inherently to do with the European financial slash regional landscape as well, how your European Union is also structured. We, we kind of compare ourselves to the US, but we're not the US, we're actually different countries with their own sovereignty and all rules and regulations and financial laws and innovation landscape. So we, we do need that one sort of headquarter where we can bring different things together. I, I know this is in the works and this is sort of developing, but obviously once, you know, it becomes easier for all these stakeholders to know, okay, I go to this one website or one place and I get all the information I needed in one pit stop, everything from grants to business plan modeling to, to IP and whatnot, scale up X, X, Y, Z, then obviously this is going to help the process and make it easier. Um, point one. Point two, I'd like to go back to the IP transfer point. Um, it's, it's just the thing that we see a lot as early stage investors where that's the bottleneck sort of. So even if you have great public funding and the startups are willing to spin out, at some point there's a bottleneck and that is really trying to get IP out of research institution. Obviously, if you have a digital startup that doesn't have a patent, this is something a little bit different, but usually for deep tech and high tech, the, it happens in laboratories with facilities with laboratory infrastructure so obviously the research institution or university is going to have a claim and a general ip tech transfer alliance that's inter-european wide where there are standard best practice conditions to really aid that process i think would help a lot to bring that 
public funding startup really out because that is what we see as a bottleneck as an early stage investor we have cases where we want to invest in a startup they want to spin out and then the discussion over ip worst case they've already signed an ip transfer agreement with a research institution that's completely abnormal in terms of market conformity meaning that at that point that startup becomes unattractive for any other investor which either means we have to renegotiate or not invest because it's just not a viable business plan anymore if you know if you're the developmental milestones the sales milestones and all these points that come in the ip agreement are too high so that's the worst case the best case scenario is we actually go in with the founders to try to help them structure this sort of ip agreement um, which is not trivial which takes weeks and it's it just would uncomplicate a lot of the process Great. So you would like a one-stop shop, I guess, Fabian, and in due course, you'll be telling us the European Innovation Council aims to be that. And, and Marie, you'd also like a easier uh, tech transfer. I used to be very fond of saying, and still am, that if you look in America, most uh, founders who've uh, grown successful businesses give the university much more money in a donation than you ever tax them on the IP. I think that's always useful to bear in the back of your mind. Leopold, what would you do to improve... Uh, uh, tech uh, and innovation in Europe? Oh, I'll, I'll be very practical, Mark, here, because it's all about better resources allocation, by the way. Huh? It's, uh, it's, about, it's a bit my industrial background that brings me to say that. And we have the chance here to have wonderful projects called the tracks with 175 objectives and maybe beyond that, thousands of objectives, you know, that we could screen and work on. And I, I like and love the, uh, the quote of Marie about this exchange platform. We are working uh, at Erma on a platform and we'll use the Attract program as a, as a pilot uh, to, to, to test it on, a, on an exchange platform in between public and private financing, private meaning uh, private, private like a VC fund, but also corporate venturing funds to exchange uh, data around all these projects and understand how it works and what's missing there and who could be the right stakeholder to get in and, 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 and discuss in between all the people in, the, in a platform, on a platform called Flow, what we will use there. We'll try to make this exercise very practically successful. That's what I would, I would do. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Giorgio, what would you do? Uh, what would you do to try and improve innovation and tech in, in Europe? Well, um, I would take advantage, I would make uh, measures favoring taking advantage of the knowledge that is developed at research infrastructure. This is my topic. Uh, research infrastructures are big technology and organizational problem solvers. Uh, people working at research infrastructure uh, are used to invest millions, tens of millions, occasionally hundreds of millions uh, in a, in a, per year uh, to build something or to organize something that was not built before or was not organized that way before. So uh, job uh, headhunters from industry should look at those people because those people can be extremely helpful in an innovative uh, environment uh, with the economic or social scope, not only uh, pure research scope. And so training, let's say, is, is a big, uh, is a big uh, uh, title that uh, science can contribute to the society beyond doing good science, which is, of course, the, the fundamental scope and the fundamental important things. Great. So, um, that's very good. So we should send the headhunters in to look uh, when we're doing tech augmentation to the uh, research infrastructures for the problem solvers who are engineers and can solve the problems. Fabian, I'm going to give you the last word on what you would do to improve uh, the European innovation landscape. Over to you. We have conducted in order to define our policy for the future and what we could do through Horizon Europe in the future, we have launched a public consultation. And there were three main elements uh, that uh, the different players of the innovation ecosystem have mentioned to you. So what can we do in order to foster innovation 
first of all, of course, uh, capital funding is key. We need to have to provide continuous funding uh, to our innovators. Then, I also mentioned it before, we need to bring them together. And this was uh, said by Leopold Marie as well, that we need to connect these different uh, actors, investors, uh, innovators, education. We need to bring them together and to, to connect them and to provide them the means, the platform, in order to exchange their experience, in order to uh, bring their innovations to the market. And also an important element which has been, uh, which has been indicated was uh, that we need the right competences as well to uh, innovate. And this is key uh, in the educational process. This is key in fostering also the entrepreneurial culture that we have among young people. And this is also key to have the right competences. And I think it is um, 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 uh, Giorgio also who mentioned it, or, or Leopold, that these competences are key in order to, uh, to, to, to make this uh, innovation uh, flourish and also to get to the market. So here we have this, according to me, these three elements which are essential. And uh, in talking about competences and talking about um, to the, the people who innovate, I believe that uh, also Attract, for instance, is a very good example because in the Attract project, they have brought young people from a different age, different background, different experience, in order to uh, think about how these deep technologies could also be useful for the society. And this diversity of research teams, of innovation teams, according to me, is essential also to bring new innovations to the market, which maybe as a last word for me would be important is that we uh, also should keep in mind that uh, having these different aspects is uh, also clearly linked to the fact that we need the people, we need to put the people at the core. Those who are facing the current crisis are the people, those who are trying to find the solution are the educators, are the uh, researchers, are the innovators, and those who try to bring them to the market are the businesses, the investors, and we always come back together, to come back again to the people who make this innovation uh, ecosystem grow and who make this innovation ecosystem a success. So that would be my last word that we keep uh, our uh, that we keep research and innovation and the people who build them uh, at the core of our strategies and policies and also to whom we direct also our policies. Very good. So very people centric uh, view there. It's really interesting. You know, the diversity piece is really important. You know, if you want to be innovative and think left field and out of the box, then you need a diverse group in order to uh, inform uh, that. And that may be diverse in lots of different ways, background, experience, uh, gender, geography, uh, uh, whatever. So I think that's really interesting and a good ecosystem with procurement from industry, even military procurement, which we haven't spoken about. That's actually really very important driver, for example, in the United States, uh, all the way through to really creative ideas that are coming in the university system, the investment uh, that goes into that, and then the incubator and networking. I mean, it's not a linear thing. It's a circular thing. Each of them uh, feed off each other. And I think I'd just like to close this session by saying, that Europe is still and will remain a very attractive uh, place for innovators. Everyone always thinks the United States is uh, better and it's different, okay, because it's a single market and, uh, and a single system. But Europe has diversity and I've just said that diversity is really important. And Europe has social values and that's really important in addressing things like climate change and the green agenda uh, and so on. And Europe has coherence. We can work together in teams um, and we can mobilize the capital. We have creative ideas and we can scale those companies. So I would want to send a strong message that uh, programs like Attract and programs like the European Innovation Council and lots of others are really important. Companies are really important. Investors are really important. Scientists with great ideas are important. Infrastructure is important. Procurement is important. And it's all here. So if you're listening to this and you're an innovator, just get out there, be persistent. If you've got a great idea and you've got a good market, keep going and you'll make it through. So thank you very much to all of the panelists. Thank you uh, for those who are listening. I hope you found this of value. So thank you, Mark, Marie, Fabienne, Leopold and Giorgio for this very lively panel. So it was the last panel of the day. Um, you might have realized it was a recorded panel and we got uh, some questions through Slido, so we do our best to get back to you. But thanks a lot for your interest uh, in this panel as it was shown by the question that uh, you sent us. Mm -hmm.